One other thing that is not going to happen today, we'll do that next week. So we are going to jump right into our next series. All right, we're jumping in with both feet. And I want you to know what a struggle I've had this week. I started off with 17 pages of notes. <laughs> Yesterday I got it down to 13. <laughs> Last night before bed, I arbitrarily narrowed it down to about nine. Um, we're not going to get all nine. Um, actually, what I've decided is I'm going to try and stick to the bare bones, um, and then I'll let you guys do research on your own. Okay? What we're going to be talking about next, we're going to be talking about the essentials of our faith. Um, you know, the, the maxim in the church, uh, St. Augustine laid it down, is that we have to have unity in the essentials. Okay, We have to be in agreement in the essentials. We have to have liberty in the non-essentials. And we have to have charity in all things. Love in all things. Okay, The problem that we have is most of us have no clue what is essential and what is non-essential. Now we make non-essential things essential and require that everybody believes the same way we do. And that's where we get into trouble. Because a lot of what is in Scripture is not essential unto salvation. It's essential unto godly living. Okay? They're, they're things that God desires of us so that we might better represent Him. Now, one of the things that we can talk about, uh, we talked about last week, alcohol. Quite honestly, I don't like it. I don't drink it. I don't have a moral stance on alcohol. Alcohol is just a thing. It's just there. What I have a moral stance on is drunkenness. Okay? Don't be drunk. That's pretty simple. It says, don't be drunk. Okay? Um, I don't know at what stage drunk is for you. You know, if your tipsy is drunk or just flat out on the ground and your vomit is drunk, uh, you know, don't. Okay, we, we can agree. It says don't, so don't. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I grew up in a church where alcohol was forbidden. Forbidden fruit. And, and actually sat through a series on how all that Jesus drank was actually grape juice. <laughs> squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Okay, we're good. They had no way to refrigerate it. They had no way to keep it. It was fermented. It was wine. They're not so stupid in Scripture as they don't understand the difference between juice and wine. Okay, so let's let's just lay that one to rest. Uh, when they says they drink wine, they drink wine. Okay, um, but you notice that Jesus was never drunk. Okay, and and you know we see that he went to parties and and the first thing we're going to do when we get together with him is we're going to celebrate and we're going to have a party and he's going to drink of the wine again. Okay, so there's going to be wine there. So for you teetotalers, I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> I don't. You know, I, hopefully he'll give me a taste for it by then. I don't know. Okay. But what, what my point is, is that we oftentimes get so wrapped up in non-essentials that we cause division. And we actually, there's, there's even animosity. You know, I mean, some of the things that I've heard come out of Christians' mouths about other Christians has absolutely floored me. Just, just floored me. Um... Uh, many of you know that the, the head of the Westboro Baptist Church passed away last week. Um, I, I have a lot of issues with things that he did. I think he missed the entire point of the gospel. However, I'm absolutely astounded at the number of Christians that are celebrating his passing, not because he's gone on to glory, but because he's out of this world. That floors me. I'm sorry. That, that just to me is astounding. This is a salvation of grace. And we have unlimited grace offered to us. You'd think we might be able to at least parcel some of it out to others. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to focus on the essentials. What do we believe at Jesus Community Church are the essentials of the faith? What do we have to agree on? Okay. And today, we're actually going to start on, uh, interestingly enough, in all the different lists that I've looked at as to the essentials of the faith, this was only included as a footnote or a side note. And I'm actually going to start with this because to me, if you don't have this, all of the rest of it is a house of cards and it falls down. Okay? So today we're going to go to school. All right? Today we're going to learn about 
the Bible. You know, oh, I know all about the Bible. Okay. But we're going to talk about how we can know that we can trust God's Word. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, um, we're reminded that without a superior intellect and without deep religious study, it is impossible to please God. <laughs> Okay, feel free to correct me at any time. <laughs> because that's not what it says. That's how we live, but that's not what it says. Okay? Um, what does it say? Without faith. Now, interestingly enough, just a couple verses before that, it told us what faith was. What is faith? Josh, tell us what faith is. It's in Hebrews 11, 1. <laughs> you, you had it correct last week. Um, well, depend, depending on the version, is different, but belief and assurance is what right. I usually look at it as. Yeah, we, we believe and we are assured. Okay, we believe in what we hope for, and we're assured of what we can't see. Okay, and so God has called us to be a people of faith. Now, for a long time, I struggled with this because in a lot of the circles that I was, faith seemed to be directly opposed to intellect. Now, sometimes it is, because sometimes God has you do something that just makes no sense. You remember Naaman? Does anybody remember Naaman? Okay. Lepers, yeah, and, and came in and, and he talked to the prophet, the prophet said, oh yeah, go dip in the Jordan. You want me to go dip in that muddy thing? Oh, come on, Really? Seven times, not just one, seven times. Seven times in your muddy little creek of a river? I got clean water where I come from. I'll just go dip there. And what happened? Okay, made no sense. But he went and he dipped. And he came out clean. Okay, uh, but Noah, well, you know we got the movie Noah. Is it out? I don't know if it's out or it's coming out. Um, quite honestly, I'm, I'm pretty disgusted with what I've heard about it. Um, I'll reserve... Final judgment until I somebody actually that I trust sees it and, and can tell me about it. I have no plan to see it unless somebody says, yeah, it was right on. Uh, I'm not expecting that. Um, but no. All right. Now, you want to talk about faith? Noah, I want you to build an ark. Now, I love the Bill Cosby version of this. Okay. I think that just, that suits it to a T. Yeah, right, God, what's an ark? So, you know, it's a boat. I want you to make it so many cubits by so many cubits by so many cubits. Right, God, what's a cubit? You know, and, and he makes an ark. You understand that it had never rained to that point in the history of the world? There had never been such a thing as rain. Where do you want me to park this thing, God? We'll just put it in the field. I'll take care of the, you know, we'll take care of the floating. And so, for how many years did he work on this? 120 years. 120 years. He's out there working on a boat for an event that has never happened in the history of the world because a voice told him to. So he builds an ark. And God says, now I want you to get two of every animal and stick them in the ark. <laughs> really? Okay, God, I, you know, sheep, those are fine, cows, all right. Lions, so long as you keep the mouth shut, okay. I ain't bringing snakes. <laughs> Man, you cursed them in the garden. Let them die. <laughs> so he loads all the animals up. God brings them. He gets them on the ark, and off they go. The heavens open up. The bowels of the earth open up. And something that has never happened before and has not happened since, the entire earth is flooded. Okay, now, faith. Noah did what he did on faith. Okay, now we have all of Hebrews 11 talks about the people of faith. We call that the, the, the hall of faith. Okay, um, When you have opportunity, actually let me change that. Make opportunity. Go through and read about each of those people and then find the stories. And read the stories. And see what they actually did. Okay, Because it is by faith that we receive salvation. Okay, So God has called us to be a people of faith. However, one of the things that I had to learn, and it took me a long time to learn, and sometimes I'm still learning it, is that faith does not require you to be stupid. Okay? I, I'm going to share with you, I actually prayed for years that God would reduce my IQ that he might increase my faith. Okay? Yeah, I think he might have. 
<laughs> Man, when I was a teenager, I knew so much more than I know now. I, you know, I, my prayers were efficacious. Because, man, when I was a teenager, it was easy. I had it all figured out. And then life hit. Okay? So, one of the things that I, I, I want to share with you, okay? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We have to please Him. Okay? But He has not called us to be foolish. So, we're going to talk about how can we trust this? How can we trust this? Because there is a lot of stuff out there today that tells you, you cannot trust this. Okay? The liberal world says, oh, this is just a collection of stories that, that they're, they're just really nice stories. And we don't even know. We, they probably, I mean, really, there's no way you can trust them. I mean, because they just rewrote them according to what they wanted. We have cults that go, oh, you can't trust this, we need further revelation because at some point between the writing of this and when our faith came out, this got perverted. And it was twisted, and it was made wrong, and it was made in man's image, so we need a further revelation of this to show us what this really meant, what it was supposed to be originally, garbage. Okay, my answer to that first, just out of my gut, is if your God is so small that he can't keep intact the word that he's given you as his promise, what makes you think he's going to give you anything different? I don't want to serve that kind of a God. I don't want to serve a God that inept. Okay? So, where did we get this? We're going to take a look at some things. I actually have uh, quite a few notes. I'm going to give you, uh, on the table over there, there's actually a couple sheets from uh, Hank Hanegraaff. He's got a, a mnemonic to help you remember uh, how to address questions about the Bible, the authenticity and the historicity of the Bible. Okay, And that, that's just a fancy way of saying, how can I trust it? All right. Um, one of the things that we have to do is, Christopher will love this, we have to be prepared to give an answer. We have to be apologists, not apologizers. Okay, We're not apologizing for anything. As a matter of fact, uh, back in the early 90s, there was a, a well-known televangelist that came out and was actually griping at um, a, people that were apologists because he said, oh, we don't need to apologize for anything, and I'm not apologizing for the Bible. He completely misunderstood what an apologist is because the word comes from the Greek apologium. Okay, and if you flip open with me to uh, Second Peter, I'm sorry, First Peter, chapter three. First Peter is right before Second Peter. For those of you that are looking. <laughs> should suffer for righteousness sake you will be blessed have no fear of them nor be troubled but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience so that when you are slandered those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame all right this right here is the core of apologetics. Right here. Okay? And he talks about, um, first, we, don't be afraid of them. Those are the people that are coming against you. Okay? Don't be afraid of them. That's one of the biggest things that we need to learn is we don't have to be afraid of them. They can't do anything but what our Father allows them to do. 
And anything that he allows them to do is ultimately to bring him glory, which is really what we're supposed to be about in the first place, right? Okay, so don't be afraid of them. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Okay, remember, okay, there's that word holy. Oh, there's a churchy word. What does that mean? Set apart. He set apart. Okay, honor Christ the Lord as set apart. Okay, unique. Always being prepared to make a defense. Uh, some of your versions, I say, I think it says, always being prepared to give an answer. Right? Does anybody have that? I think that's an NIV. Okay. Um, so, what he's saying is, you always have to be ready to answer when somebody asks. That word there for defense or answer in some of them is apologius. Apologetics, okay? The word literally means to defend, okay? And what he's telling us is we have to understand why we believe so when people ask us, we can tell them. Now, some people are incredibly gifted at this. When I was, I was doing my studies, um, you know, we have some incredible uh, apologists in our time. Uh, Robbie Zacharias, Lee Strobel, Josh McDowell. We have some men whose minds are just very well suited to this. I'm not one of them, okay? Um, a lot of the work that I've done has been gathering information that they've done and cross-checking and examining to make sure that I'm not getting off on somebody's particular peculiarity, okay? But we have to be prepared to give an answer as to why we believe what we believe, all right? Um, for the hope that is in you, well, see, there's, there's a catch right there because you have to have hope in you. They're probably not going to ask a whole lot of questions if you don't have hope in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. This is where we talked about the Westboro Baptist Church. This is where I think they missed it. Okay. Quite honestly, I don't know a lot about their theology. But that's really irrelevant. That's a moot point. Because their approach to the presentation of their theology flies in the face of God's word. Okay. There's no gentleness and respect in what they were doing. So, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ are put to shame. Alright? So, let the testimony of your life support the testimony of your mouth. So, when you talk about Christ Jesus, your life actually gives an indication that you are living out what you say you believe. Alright? So, right here, we have apologetics. A defense of the faith. And we are, each and every one of us, called to be prepared to give a defense of the faith. All right? So we're not going to go, to, this, this study is not going to be about apologetics, although we're going to have to touch on it. But the first thing, the cornerstone, in my understanding, to move forward in any understanding of why we believe what we believe, is we have to be able to trust this. Okay? Because this is where we get it. This is where we start. Okay? Now, we can go outside of this because, you know, Scripture tells us that, that nature itself declares God's glory. He's given us a conscience to declare Himself to us. There are all kinds of things. God's creation will cry out His glory to Him. Okay? So we know that everything is working on His behalf. He's going to do it how He wants. But this is where we start. Because, I don't know, when I came to the Lord, it wasn't because some plant told me so. <laughs> Now, a lot of times in the church, I've discussed things with vegetative matter. <laughs> Sometimes I myself have been vegetative. But ultimately, it was based and rooted in what was in you. Okay? So if you can't trust what this says, we're already in trouble. We've built our house on the sand. Okay? So do you see why it's important that we know we can trust this? Okay? So we're going to talk about uh, quite a few things. Uh, on the table over there, the mnemonic that um, Hank Canagraph has put together is MAPS, M-A-P-S, okay? And it's easy to remember because in the back of your Bible, you have MAPS, <laughs> right? So when somebody asks you about, well, how can you trust the Bible? Well, you can get all fancy and say, well, according to the authority and the authenticity of Scripture, here's why. Or you can just say, well, MAPS, M. Manuscripts. Now, when we are talking about how we can trust that the Bible that we have today is 
dependent on and close to the Bible that was written. Here's, here's the problem that we run into. First, we do not have any of the original manuscripts. We don't have the parchment or the tablets or the papyrus that any of the writers of the Bible put pen to or stylus or whatever. Okay? We don't have those. Okay? That's not unusual. We don't have any original writings from ancient texts. Okay? So we don't have the original writings from Julius Caesar. Not, not the play. His, his writings. Okay? We don't have the writings, the original writings of Vegetus or Philo or or um, his name is friend right now. Socrates. Okay? We don't have those original writings. We don't have original writings of Homer. And yet, nobody questions that he wrote the Iliad or the Odyssey. Why? That's where we get into the authority and the historicity. Okay? Now, manuscripts. What we do have are copies. Early copies. And one of the things that we want to look at, um, there's fancy words for all of this. I'm going to try and keep it as simple as I can. Okay, if you want to get into the fancy stuff, actually, um, I brought this today. This is in the library. Josh McDowell does an incredible job summing all this up. But he's going to go way deeper than 99% of us have any interest in. Okay. Um, what did I, I think it was about that much just deals with the Bible and how we can trust it. Okay, so I'm going to set this over here. Uh, you can check this out. Take a, take a glance through it. There's two uh, volumes in that set. Evidence that demands a verdict. How we can trust our faith. Okay. Um, but one of the things, uh, if you would put that slide up, please. One of the things that we have to look at is how close are our copies to the original documents and how many of them do we have? Now, I put up here this graph, and there's copies of the graph sitting over on the... Well, I don't know where I put them. Do you know where I put them? The table over there? there? I put them somewhere. Feel free to look at them. Um, what I just want to point out to you. Now, if you look on the left, it has the author or the works. When it was written down, uh, the date of the manuscripts that we have. Okay? So that, and then after that, you'll see the time span from when it was written to our earliest copy of that document. And then how many copies we actually have? How many that survived? Okay? Now you'll notice the first one is Caesar. It was written sometime between 144 BC. Okay, somewhere in there. We don't know exactly. It's thought it's closer to about um, 65 BC, but, but it's, it's somewhere in there. Um, the earliest manuscript we have is from 900 AD. So that's almost a thousand years difference. Okay? And we only have ten of them. Ten. Ten manuscripts. Now what's interesting about this is if you ask any literary critic, they don't have a problem saying, oh yeah, we know Caesar wrote this. And, and, and you go, well, well, wait a minute. There's, there's textual errors here, but that's okay. That was, that was an author's error. There was a, a problem. They, they probably misspelled it, or they, you know, and we'll get into that in a minute. But, but they don't have any problem with that. Uh, we, let's go down and look at Tacitus. AD 56 to AD 120. Uh, the earliest manuscript we have is AD 800. There's 900 years difference. We only have three copies. And yet that's, it, well, I don't know if it still is. It used to be required reading for anybody in military school. Okay? Um, you can just kind of see, uh, like I said, Homer, down at the bottom, second to the bottom, Homer, 900 B.C., when they think it was penned, we don't know for sure, but that's when we think it was penned, the, the date of the earliest manuscript we have is 400 B.C., 500 years difference, and we have 643 copies. Now, I had to read that in school. I don't know, did anybody else have to read either the Iliad or the Odyssey in school? Okay. Did any of your teachers say, well, we don't know that Homer wrote it. We don't even know if Homer even existed. We, don't, we, don't, we can't trust this. No. But now look at that last one. This is just the New Testament. And I'm going to floor you here in just a minute. Or you better be floored because I was floored. The New Testament. 
It was written, the earliest part was written at approximately AD 35. The latest part, they believe, was AD 100. I, actually, I, I disagree with this. And I'll tell you why. Because nowhere in the New Testament does anybody record the fall of Jerusalem. Don't you think for the early church that would have been a significant event? Mm -hmm. And yet it's not recorded anywhere in there. Nowhere in the New Testament is recorded the death of Paul or Peter. Okay? So with Paul and, and Peter having been martyred between about 62 to 65 A.D., and the fall of Jerusalem in 72 A.D. See, I think 100 A.D. is too late. I, I think you've got to back that up almost 30 years, possibly a little bit more than 30 years. All right? Now, uh, you know, I know there's people that go, oh, you yeah, did, yeah, 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 yeah. um, <laughs> Liberal estimators put it at 100. Conservative put it back to about 65 to 70. All right? But even so, let's just go up the liberal number of 100 years. We have... Earliest manuscript between 100 AD and 150 AD. We have approximately 35 years from the original manuscript to our earliest extant copies. 35 years. I'm older than that. Okay? So we have a span of somewhere between 5 and 30 years from the original copy, the original manuscript to the copies. We have 5,700 copies that have survived of the New Testament. Now, here's where things get really trippy. This is what's really going to trip you up. All right? We have over 14,000 fragments of the New Testament. Just the New Testament. If you add the Old Testament, and we start talking about original copies, you know, going back to these times, the earliest copies we have of the Old Testament, I think, is 350 uh, B.C., <coughs> We have the Septuagint, which was written shortly thereafter. We have copies of that. Um, if we add all those in, we're over 50,000 copies. 50,000 copies. Now, here's where things really get... They are 97% textually pure. That means that in 97% of everything that's written, they all say this exact same thing. 97%. Now, what's interesting is of the 3%, 90% of that is grammar errors. Spellings. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something. Oh, I hope I'm going to read it. Because <laughs> that may have been one that I just threw out this morning. I think I did. I threw it out this morning. Okay, the errors include uh, literary devices such as fission and fusion. Okay, fission is where you take and you stick two words together. You take no and where, and you stick them together. Or you take now and here, and you stick them together. And it's not supposed to be nowhere. It's supposed to be now here. Okay, and and that's fusion. Fission is the opposite, where you take a word that was together, you had nowhere, and you split them apart, and you put now here. Okay? And those are actually, they're, they're actually fairly simple to take care of. Some of the other mistakes are adding extra letters in. Okay? Uh, when they spell somebody's name, they put an extra letter in. And they go, oh, well, see, obviously this isn't of God, because Peter has three E's. It's P-T-E-R. <laughs> oh, okay. Um... When, when you start listening to their arguments, you start to realize how faulty their logic is, how desperate they are to deny God. Okay? So, of the remaining portions, I'm going to give you an example. Um, does anybody know what the Septuagint is? Jeannie, can you, can you explain to us what the Septuagint is? That's how you know. I thought... <laughs> it's the uh, Hebrew translated into the Greek. Right. Uh, back about the 300 BC, uh, the king of Egypt, Ptolemy, who was a very uh, learned man, uh, one of his, his advisors told him about these Hebrew laws that he was just astounded at. And so he sent to Jerusalem, to the high priest, whose name at that point was Eleazar, and he asked him if he could have some scholars come and, and, and expound to him the, the Hebrew laws. 
And so Eleazar sent six men from each tribe. And they, were, they went to Egypt, and they, they talked with this counselor and Ptolemy. And he was so impressed that he asked them, could you, would you, write the Hebrew Scriptures in Greek so that there can be general edification for anybody that wants to read it. Okay, so they were put on the Isle of Pharos, um, and, and in 72 days, they translated the entire Old Testament. Okay, and that's, that's the earliest that we have of from Hebrew to Greek. Now, we still have copies of this manuscript. We don't have the original manuscript, but we have copies of this manuscript. Okay, now, um, interestingly enough, we know that Jesus quoted from the Septuagint because certain turns of phrase were done according to the Greek rendering rather than to the Hebrew rendering. <coughs> so we know that Jesus had access to the Septuagint. All right? Now what's really tricky, does anybody know about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 1947, a uh, shepherd boy was walking, he went in a cave, and he found a bunch of clay jars, and inside of them were a bunch of papyrus writings, and, 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 and he pulled them out, and he looked, oh, mm, mm, mm. And, and it was a bunch of scripture. Now, interestingly enough, these scriptures were written over a thousand years at a separate time from the manuscripts we have of the Septuagint. I'm going to give you uh, some examples. Um, Isaiah chapter, I think it was either, I think it was 63. Uh, they compared these thousand years differences in these two letters. Okay? There were 17 differences in the entire chapter. 17 differences. Of those 17, uh, all but three had to do with spelling errors. They, they just misspelled words. Okay? Um, the three that remain actually combined to make one word, light. Which in the Masoretic texts was not was not there. They, Aha! They added light. <laughs> but in the Septuagint, that word is there. So what's interesting about this is it's not a discrepancy between here and here. It's a discrepancy between the Greek and the Hebrew. You, you, you see, the Greeks chose to render it in a way that was going to be understandable outside of the Hebrew mind. Okay. Now, did it change the the rendering of? The passage? Absolutely not. It didn't do anything. If anything, it just clarified what was being said. All right. So over a thousand years difference, they compare these two writings, and they're virtually identical. So what does that mean? What that means is that literary criticism, textual criticism, how we're not talking about Christians. Okay, we're just talking about how people whose job it is to study ancient manuscripts to find out whether they're valid or not. When they look at these things and they go, oh yeah, no, that couldn't have been, you know, any one of those, let's say Aristotle, it couldn't have been Aristotle because these things are off. Um, the textual criticism for the Bible is impeccable. Impeccable. All right? So manuscripts... M, manuscripts. We have over 5,000 fully intact books of the Bible, New Testament, all combined with all the fragments and everything that we have, 50,000. The dates range from less than 35 years to no more than 350 years. Okay? In the span from the original, this is what I wrote, and this is what they copied. All right? An easy way for you to look at this, I, I, I saw this illustration. This is how it's easiest for you to understand. Um, Aunt Susie gets sick. Okay? And it looks like she's going to die. And one night, God appears to her and says, Susie, I'm going to give you the recipe for perpetual health. And she wakes up in the morning, and she takes that recipe, and she writes it out, and she makes the stuff. And lo and behold, <laughs> Aunt Susie is the picture of life and health. And she's so excited about this that she wants to share it with her bridge club members. I don't even know what bridge is. I know they play cards and talk. I mean, if guys get together for bridge club, they're building something. And so she gives this recipe to them. 
and they take it. Well, they're so excited because they become the picture of life and health that they write out and, and they give copies to their friends. Tragedy of tragedies. Aunt Susie uses her recipe. And so she calls her, her bridge club. I, I've lost the recipe. I need the recipe. Can I get you the recipe? I, I don't have it anymore. I, 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 don't, I, I don't have it. Well, can, did, did, did you make... 47 copies are brought back to her. Now, of the 47 copies, there's only three that have differences from the original. And in those three, two of them say chop and then blend, instead of blend and then chop. And one of them added a spurious ingredient that was just to help it make it taste better, but was not necessary to the recipe. Okay? That's what we're talking about with all of these manuscripts. Thousands upon thousands of them to prove. Now, one of the things that you'll hear is that in the Dark Ages, something happened and God needed to rely on Joseph Smith or Charles Taze Russell or somebody else to fix his word that was broken because man in the Dark Ages became absolutely fearless of God and decided to write the Bible in his own image. So we have the Pearl of Great Prize, Doctrines of <coughs> Covenants, the Book of Mormon, the New World Translation, and we have all these things that fix the errors. Here's the problem with that. We have the same copies today that they had then. We actually have more copies today than they had then. Not only do we have more of them, but they're more easily accessible. They're more available. You can go look at the Dead Sea Scrolls online. Come up with your translation that should read fairly close to what this translation does. Okay? So, the problem with that is, is there's no time span when that could have happened such that all of the other manuscripts were rewritten. Alright? So, there goes Mormon's premise, there goes the Jehovah's Witness premise, there goes the, the Islam's premise. Did you, did you know they considered themselves people of the book? And that the Quran was written because the Bible was perverted? You know, that, did you know that? So there goes theirs out the window. Okay, there is no perversion here. Okay, there's nothing that they can hold to. So manuscripts, we're going to jump ahead. I'm going to hit the rest of these pretty quick, so keep up. Archaeology. <coughs> this is one of the areas that uh, is problematic for non-believers. Uh, Sir William Ramsey, uh, back in the 1800s, uh, was so opposed to the Bible that he determined, he was an archaeologist from England, he was going to go to uh, Palestine. That's what he referred to it as. That's a, don't, don't, don't get mad at me, Gene. <laughs> That's what he called it. Okay. To, to prove that all the stuff in the Bible couldn't happen. Now, Sir William Ramsey uh, was about 43 years he spent over in Israel looking up the different things and, and trying to disprove the Bible. And it, it only took him about seven years to realize that the accuracy of the Bible was so complete that he gave his heart to the, to the Lord. Okay? And then he spent the remaining time proving and proving and proving and proving what happened. Okay? Every day, we're seeing things come up that prove Scripture true. You know, um, we, we have names. One of the problems that people had, um, Daniel. They did the, oh, the book of Daniel can't be right because there was never a king by the name of uh, Belshazzar. That we, we've been all in and out and throughout Babylon and there's no King Belshazzar. Um, actually, he was appointed regent under another king. And there is an actual... Uh, uh, script on the wall that talks about this king having had trouble in the far west of his realm and he needed to go address it. So he packed up and he left and went to the far west of his realm and in his place he left Belshazzar to rule in his stead. <gasps> oh my goodness, Daniel was right. Okay. Archaeology. Over and over and over again, archaeology continues to support that what God's Word says is authentic. It's accurate. Okay? Now, there are some things that we don't know. Mount Sinai. Okay? 
Uh, traditionally, we have Mount Sinai down at the southern end of the uh, Arabian Peninsula. But, but other scriptures seem to indicate that it would be in Arabia, which would put it much closer to Israel. And we, so we kind of scratch our heads and we go, well, where is it? Does it matter? Can, I, can, I'm, I'm asking you personally. Does it really matter? Because for me, I don't have any plans that God is going to call me back to Mount Sinai to give me any laws on rocks because he's already done away with that and he's written his law on my heart. Okay. Now, if it becomes necessary, I think God will prove it. I, I don't think it's necessary. I, I really don't. I don't think it adds to or takes away from Scripture whether you believe it was this mountain or that mountain. I, I, I don't think it really matters. So archaeology, maps, M-A, manuscripts, archaeology, P, prophecy, uh-oh, oh my. Um, there are hundreds, hundreds of literally fulfilled prophecies in the Old and the New Testament. And, you know, I'm, I'm not even going to try and get into I'll just I'll just touch some of them. Um, <coughs> the city of Tyre. Um, Ezekiel 26.3 says that Tyre is going to be opposed by many nations, its walls would be destroyed, and its towers broken down. Now, we know that under Alexander the Great, he, the, the thing that was unique about Tyre was it was set off of the mainland. You could only get to it through this narrow peninsula. Well, Alexander the Great comes and he says, Sir, and they're like, ha ha, nobody's ever conquered us. You know, the French taunter was up there harassing. And Alexander gathered his army together and said, All right, man, put the swords down, grab the shovels. And they built an earthwork that was wide enough across that his army could march from the mainland all the way out to Tyre and they destroyed it. All that remains are cast down rocks. You can actually still see the earthwork today, the, the, the land bridge that they built out there. Nobody has ever moved back in to that city. Okay? Um, we have prophecies that Babylon would be thrown down and never lived in again. We have prophecies that Edom would be thrown down and never lived in again. Uh, we have prophecies that Nineveh would be thrown down and never lived in again. All of these things <coughs> All right. The birth of Jesus. Well, let's see. Let's see, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be born a virgin. He's going to go um, into Egypt. He'll come out of Egypt. He'll come out from Nazareth. Um, you know, I, I counted 17 prophecies just through reading through the, the, the Christmas story last Christmas. 17 prophecies that from different points in the Old Testament were fulfilled just in the birth of Jesus Christ. So prophecies. Um, take a look at it. You know, Google it. Google it. How many biblical prophecies have been fulfilled? You'll be amazed. I mean, some of them I didn't even realize were prophecies. <coughs> you know, that I just I read through and I just go, oh yeah, he's just saying something, and then all of a sudden, boink, oh look, that happened because that guy. Remember when that guy said that? Okay. So take a look at that prophecies. Um, the last one we have. Manuscripts, archaeology, prophecy, S, statistics. Now this is where things get really cool. Um, well, it's all cool. <laughs> let's, let's just look at how the Bible was written. Right? <coughs> we have the Bible. It's written over a span of 1,500 years, 1,500 years, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 1. Okay. 1,500 years. We have 40 different authors coming from all different areas of life. We've got fishermen. We've got shepherds. We've got kings. We've got wise men. We've got the rich. We've got the poor. You, you can't hardly think of an area of life and not have it represented by one of the writers in Scripture. We've got the incredibly educated and the not educated writing. Okay? 
It was written in three different languages. Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Three different languages on three different continents. Africa, Asia, and Europe. So three different languages, three different continents, 40 different writers, 1,500 year span, and yet one theme is woven throughout the entire collection of books from beginning to end. Okay? And that's man's separation from God and God's redemptive work in man. Okay? All the way through. Now, I, I read a little thing where Josh McDowell had a, a gentleman come to his door and he was selling him um, the book collection, the greatest books ever written. And he brought this guy in and he was talking about um, the Bible. He, he managed to turn the conversation to the Bible and he asked this guy, he said, I would, I would challenge you to take 40 men out of your collection, any 40 men that you want, and out of their writings come up with a single unified thought. Go. And the guy said, there's, there's no way you can do it. Uh, you know, these men are writing in all different areas. He said, well, so are the men in the Bible. He said, there, there's, I mean, you have, you have Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. I'm working through Ecclesiastes now. Pray for me. <laughs> uh, man, I have almost no patience for Solomon at this point. <laughs> It, well, uh, but they you know, they don't have a unified thought, a unified direction, a, a unified belief. And he said, that's exactly what makes the Bible unique. unique. Now I'm going to narrow it down to one other thing and, and we're going to go. Like I said, I have made copies of this over here. This is from uh, Hank Hanegraaff's Bible Mnemonic Maps. Um, the book by Josh McDowell is up here. The second volume is in the other building. There are all kinds of websites available. Um, CRI has a bunch of stuff. Uh, Bible Answers has stuff. Uh, open Questions. Uh, there's all kinds of, of websites. Uh, I wanted to share one other thing with you. Uh, Dr. Simon Greenlee, uh, he was born in the mid-1700s. He died in the mid-1800s. He was the founder of the law school at Harvard. He was world-renowned for... Um, his, his understanding of evidence and its proper use and application in trials. He was an agnostic. Okay. Now, there's something out there, but I don't know what it is, and it doesn't have anything to do with me. Well, one of his students challenged him one day to take a look at the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from a legal standpoint, from an evidentiary standpoint. Let's take a look at this from what the evidence says. Um, Dr. Simon Greenleaf, um, he actually wrote a paper concerning his conclusions. Uh, it's called The Testimony of Evangelists. Uh, I have the website here. If you want to read that paper, it's, a, it's um, kind of a heady read. Uh, You've you got to really get your brain wrapped around what he's trying to say. Uh, but this is a man who was a legal scholar. And he looked at the evidence for the case of Christ. And he came to one determined conclusion. If all the evidence says this, then it must affect my life. And he became one of the greatest evangelists in the legal community and in America at that time. Because he said all the evidence points to this. He, he has to be who he says he is. Because everything points that way. Okay? Um, if we can stand firm on what he tells us in here. Okay. If we determine that this is the truth, we have to come to an agreement. I, I may misunderstand this. Okay. I, I may be wrong in what I'm interpreting this. You may be wrong in how you interpret this. See, this is where we are able to dialogue in maturity. We have to come into it with the understanding one or both of us is wrong. Okay. Because otherwise there would be no disagreement. And if we are in agreement, we still got to check ourselves, because we might still both be wrong. We're just now happy about it. <laughs> okay. So, but if we determine that this is the basis of all truth, okay, and we can move on from here, trusting in this, all right, then we have a platform, a stable platform with which to work. 
If we cannot agree to that, then we really, we, we, don't, we don't have a stable platform to work. This is where we get into so many problems with the Jehovah's Witness and the, the Mormons. Because, see, we don't know this. And we're not really convinced about the truth of this. Most of us really are not convinced because most of us like to play with God's Word. You know, oh, I don't believe that part of it. You know, really, a guy in an ark, really, all two of every animal in the world in an ark that size, in that many days, and nah, no, it's just a nice story. Okay, look, if it's a nice, if you're going to classify that as a nice story, how can you not classify the story of your salvation as anything but a nice story? Okay? Because, see, if you start to question any of it, you automatically question all of it. Right? Because he says, all of it is my word. All of it. So, we have to understand that. We have to understand that the parts we don't like are not because of this, it's because of this. And the parts that we disagree with in here, we don't change this, we change this. And the parts that we disagree with, we have to understand, okay, one of us or both of us is wrong. We've got to figure this out. Okay? So we're going to be talking about the essentials of our faith from here. This is where we're going to start. All right? This is where everything has to be tied back to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. I